Welcome back once again, ladies and gentlemen, to a brand new Let's Play. Today we're going to start probably my most requested game. In fact, I would probably hazard a guess at something like 75% of all the messages I received are people asking me if I'm going to play Saga Frontier 2. And I tell you what, I am. So, here we go. Saga Frontier 2 is a PlayStation 1 game released in 1999 originally, and it came over to the United States in the year 2000. It is the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8th game in the Saga series, uh, preceded by Saga Frontier, and followed by Unlimited Saga. Now, this game is a little different than Saga Frontier. Uh, where Saga Frontier had more influences from the Game Boy games, specifically uh, Final Fantasy Legend 2, with the you know the addition of mechs, mystics, and monsters. This game is more like Romancing Saga 3. There are only humans, and instead of the mechs and monsters and stuff, we have access to lots and lots of different weapon types. Uh, in addition to swords, there are spears and axes and uh, things like that. Magic in this game is also not limited. So, it's a little different. Uh, art style is different, whereas, you know, Saga Frontier 1 was very Japanese. Because, let's face it, it was. It had some other influences, but largely the game was very Japanese. This game uh, has more European influences and European styles. I, I read somewhere specifically that they actually uh, modeled the game's architecture and things like that on uh, Germanic influences and things like that. Uh, specifically Anglo-Saxon. Also, unlike Soccer from Tier 1, this game does not have eight main characters. It has two intertwining storylines. Basically, this game is told in the style of kind of a historical epic. Uh, we follow the history of two young men over the course of their lives, and over the course of the events that transpire in their lives, they end up changing the world. And this is their story. And as time goes on, while things become kind of... They're not connected at first. This game will... Sud things suddenly start... Kind of bumping heads. It's like... It's like, oh, I, I heard about that. And this is something we witnessed in a previous scenario. On the other side, on the other story. And eventually things start to crisscross. And it comes to a head at the end of the game. And it, it's a very interesting game. Now, unlike, like, say, Soccer Frontier, uh, this game is, while still very non-linear for the, uh, for a Saga game, this game is, m well, okay, while very non-linear for a RPG, this game is very linear for a Saga game. Uh, like I said, it's only... You got the two storylines, and the game takes place over the course of like 80, something like 80 years. And uh, we find out about that. Now, uh, one thing I would like to point out that this game actually does not come to the you know, new game load game window if you do not have a save point. I mean, if you don't have a save game on your memory card, so keep that in mind. If you don't have a save game on your memory card, it actually just drops you straight into the first scenario of the game, Gustav Born. Now, the two main characters are Gustav the Thirteenth and Will Knights. Both of them were born a couple of days apart, but Will's first scenario is actually when he's 15 years old. So, Gustav's got a little bit of catching up to do. I'm going to do my best to uh, play the scenarios in chronological order. Uh, specifically because if you play them in chronological order you actually don't miss any of them 
Uh, and some of the scenarios are flagged as like side quests and unless you meet specific requirements they actually do not show up this is I think kind of a bastard dick move on the developers parts I mean why why would you cut out some of the story uh, if you like to play one character over the other but anyway, uh, so like I said, I'm going to strive to play the game in a chronological sense. So let's go ahead and just jump right into Gustav Born. And when you jump right into Gustav Born, we get into a little scripted battle. It kind of sort of demonstrates the way the party battles happen in this game. There's actually two kinds of battles in this game. Technically three, but... For 90%, 99% of the game, there's two kinds of battles. There's party battles, which work a lot like they did in Saga Frontier. Uh, it's your party versus the enemies. You can uh, attack, do combos, spark new arts. There's a new kind of battle in this game called dual battles, where it's one character versus one enemy, and you do kind of a... You have kind of you have a combo input system, where uh, like you know your weapon has moves like charge, backswing, uh, strike, things like that, and you you have four moves in a turn, and you do combinations of these moves, and if you know the correct combinations, you can actually trigger arcs that way, things like that. So. Like I said, combat's a little different in this game. One of the way different things, I think, and, and I think it's a change for the better, because while I like Soccer Frontier and the way it looks, I absolutely adore the art in this game. The backgrounds in this game are absolutely gorgeous. Everything in this game is hand-painted watercolor. And uh, I actually like the way the sprites look, too, although uh, sometimes the sprites look a little gangly. Uh, some of the people look really, really, I don't know, like like Gumby people almost, but uh, I really like the art style of this game. The music is amazing too. The music in this game is, uh, overall I would say it's better than Saga Frontier 1, uh, but I will say that Saga Frontier 1 has the best final boss music of any game. Particularly, it's got like s seven really amazing final boss tracks. And, uh, you know, I've played games where they don't have one really good boss track, period. And, you know, Cyber Fusion 1 had like all the final boss musics were really, really good. And then this game, though, has just got an amazing overall soundtrack. I mean, look at that. Look how awesome that is. And you see, in the if this were Cyber Fusion 1, those flags would be static, but there's a lot of motion and stuff in art too in the backgrounds. And even though the maps themselves are not really any more interactive than the ones in Saga Frontier, uh, there's a lot of places that look like you should be able to go into, but you can't. Just like Saga Frontier One, uh, the maps in this game are just amazing. And here is our one of our protagonists. Gustav the Thirteenth. So I'm gonna go ahead and save, and I'm gonna save over this old file that I have on here. All right, we're gonna continue on. I'm gonna probably, I'm probably only gonna play up to uh, the first scenario where we actually get to play and do combat. Unfortunately, Gustav's scenarios tend to be more along the lines of cutscenes because there's a lot of political intrigue and things like that going on in his uh, scenarios and things like that. You know, lots of political maneuvering. Whereas Will's scenarios tend to be more adventuring because that's what he is. He's, an he's a professional adventurer. That's what he does for a living. He goes out to ruins of this ancient civilization and he looks for magic items that's what he does for a living 
So anyway, let's do Gustav Exiled. Now, the world, this world runs on something called spell arts. Everything in the game, almost everything in the world has what's called anima. Trees have anima, rocks have anima, wild animals have anima, humans have anima. Uh, there's different kinds of anima that do different kind of things. There's anima in water. There's anima in sound. Anima is a big deal. Now, I'm going to read this here because I know uh, this yellow text is a little hard to read. Today is the day Gustav attempts the firebrand ceremony. Like I said, serious business. The castle is turned upside down with preparations for the ceremony and party. Now, that's the firebrand. The ancestral quell of the Eugene family. Now, quells are... Okay, let, let me take a step back. To manipulate everything in this world runs on anima. It's the basis of their entire civilization. You have and a long time ago there was a civilization that was really advanced and they made quells. Well that civilization died, basically. They were extinct now. And uh, the civilization that's up now, they invented what are called tools. And basically they allow you to, with these tools, you can take the anima out and do certain things. You can do spell arts using the anima from these tools. Over the course of time, uh, the tool's anima actually gets exhausted and the tool breaks. Well, quells do not break. They're basically tools with infinite anima. So they're really, really valuable. As its name, anyway, uh, Firebrand, as its name suggests, it responds to the anima of fire. Upon reaching seven years of age, the prince of prince undergoes a ceremony to test whether he is worthy to wield Firebrand and become heir to the throne. Like I said, this is serious business. And if you have any questions about the way this world works, let me know, and I'll do my best to answer it. By the way, I think Firebrand is a stupid-looking sword. <laughs> but, on the one hand, tools are not really made for... stabbing and cutting. I mean, they're capable of doing that, but tools themselves are actually meant to... Uh, Manipulate anima. By the way, I love that effect for some reason. The whole glass becoming stone walls. Uh oh, what's this? Unfortunately, Gustav is animalist. He doesn't have any anima. Like, that's why he's making such... Like I said, his anima is a big deal in this world. Almost everybody has anima, at least of certain degrees. Uh, I mean, he's basically being considered less than a rock at this point because he does not have any anima. And the thing about quells is that they can pull... Like I said, people have varying levels of anima. Uh, later on in the story, Gustav meets a blacksmith, and he uh, basically says, "Well, I don't. I'm not so good at spell arts. It's easier for me to do this. Whereas my wife, she's really good at spell arts. She has no problem using a wooden kitchen knife to do her, you know, to cook with. Gustav has none." So, whereas people that, uh, that have just a little bit, the uh, Firebrand would be able to pull them out. That's the nature of Quells. They, they can work, they can do a lot with a little bit of anima. And they never run out of anima.
But on the other hand, uh, like I said, even though it is a big deal, this king is a jerk, honestly. Because, oh no, my battery is low. Oh, I still got a little bit of time. I, I got plenty of time to finish what I'm doing here. Uh, I lost my train of thought. Thank you. Thank you, controller, for making me lose my train of thought. Anyway, um, what kind of parent would basically drop their child over some... And what kind of irrational person would feel betrayed at a, by a seven-year-old who has absolutely no control over something like this? I mean, his mother there is having the correct reaction, I think. It's like, well, he's my... Even if he doesn't have this, he's still my son. We can't just throw him away. And the king just throws a hissy fit and banishes them both. But, of course, I, I guess kings in real life have had people beheaded for less. So the Queen and Gustav leave the castle. By the way, I have absolutely no clue what those things are called that they ride instead of horses. That is Felipe, Gustav's little brother. They don't talk about him very much at the beginning. Even though this is a slum, look how detailed it is. They did a real whoever painted these backgrounds did a really good job. I mean, look at the detail here. The crackling fire, and if you look over there next to that dresser there, watch very carefully and you'll see a cockroach coming up coming up and down the boards there. That's just hilarious to me for some reason. Go ahead and save. And I'm going to save here.